We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and um, I don't know about you, but I had a tough time this week. Uh, th this, was, this is the kind of thing that Paul is writing about, is the kind of thing that you and I were experiencing. How do we bring human understanding into something that is spiritually driven with regard to that? Paul, in this section, is setting the stage for the, discussing the problems that they have been surfacing in the Corinthian church about unit, lack of unity and partisanship. And he's reminded them that the real power in this whole deal is the power of the gospel. Uh, he preached it with simplicity. He didn't use the kind of oratorical techniques or dramatic kind of motives that uh, the Currents that the speakers uh, in the in the world of of the intellect would be having, uh, and he reminds them in chapter one, verse eighteen, that this message of the cross you just have to come to terms with the fact that it is foolishness to those who don't understand it, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel is, and then he goes on to talk about the fact that the gospel it really is valuable to all classes of people. It's not just for the intelligentsia. And in fact, uh, what he's proving is that the, uh, the classical world of intelligentsia doesn't even get it with regard to this. But it doesn't require any kind of prerequisite intelligence or wealth or class uh, with regard to that. He goes on in, at the end of chapter one to talk about that. And then he reminds them of the fact that when he was with them for those 18 months, what he did in the, at the end of uh, our section last time, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 2, he says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And that uh, understanding of the, the Spirit's power is what then is launching him into what it is that we've grappled with uh, during this week. Uh, today he zeroes in on the, the lack, the, the fact that human philosophies and human intelligence and human leaders uh, that, that have uh, been really influencing these Corinthian people, the ones who say, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm, uh, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, but I am of Christ, those things that he mentions in chapter 1. There, he reminds them that they're really being influenced by the way that the world thinks, and so he's going to show them how they don't need to be driven by that, and in fact, they shouldn't be driven by that. They shouldn't be held captive by that. Um, I wondered... Uh, as I was doing this uh, and trying last night to kind of finalize my thoughts, um, I wondered if you asked the question that I was thinking about, and that is, you know, okay, this was important for these Corinthian Christians, but what does this have to do with uh, where we are in the 21st century? How do we relate to this ancient dilemma that they had in the church? And what I've seen as, we've, as I've looked at our verses now, verses 6 through 16 of this chapter, is Paul is really highlighting the uniqueness of the gospel message as recorded in the scriptures. And he's giving insights into how that happens, how the recorded scripture, the recorded truth, how God reveals himself. He's going to give insights that, frankly, we don't see in other parts of the Bible. Uh, and so this, is, this can be a little, it can be confusing, but it also can be a little gem that we hold on to. And I hope that as, as I go through this, you'll come to uh, the understanding uh, that I uh, have re uh, really belatedly come to with regard to that. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, I don't often really rely heavily on a commentator because I, I kind of mix all this stuff up together. But John MacArthur's commentary has really been helpful to me in this, and so if you've read John MacArthur, you're going to know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but, and I do want, because I don't want to plagiarize him, I will tell you that. Look at verse 6 as we see this. This is kind of the, the segue between verse 5 and the rest of what we're going to be looking at. He says, uh, verse, verse, um, verse 5, he said, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on 
men's wisdom or on God's uh, but on God's power. Uh, but he does need to make a disclaimer. He says, we do, however, verse 6, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age or the, of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. They're, they're, they're going to be a fizzle. There won't be anything but the history books with regard to that. Whereas false human wisdom is a hindrance to the gospel because it puts up barriers to the, the understanding of the truth that God has revealed. Uh, true divine wisdom comes from the message that Paul had given to them. It's important to realize that Paul does not say, okay, let's just be ignorant. Uh, this is not his approach at all. In fact, uh, I was reading in Acts when he was uh, making a defense before one of the rulers, and, uh, and I think it was Felix said, you know, much learning uh, has made you crazy uh, because your, your brain is just so full. Paul evidently was one of the great brains of that era, and so he's not poo-pooing uh, and, you know, dumbing down uh, intelligence. What he's doing is saying you don't find God, you don't have the tools to live the spiritual life from human intelligence. It's good, uh, but don't rely on that to get you to God. Uh, he says he speaks the, to the mature, uh, and you think, well, maybe he's saying that, that you have to be, you know, a, a mature Christian, which means, you know, you've, you've walked with the Lord in, in intimacy for 60 or 70 years. Uh, that doesn't seem to be what he's talking with these people about, because they've only known the Lord uh, for five, six, seven years with regard to that. But they have, as they have come to the Lord, they have understood what has been revealed to them, and so in that sense they're mature. They're, they've taken their baby steps and now they're moving into uh, the, their adolescence, and he says, this message that I'm giving to you uh, is, is a message of wisdom to, you, to, to those who have walked in the wisdom and in the enlightenment that they have received. Uh, he says the rulers of this age, their stuff is coming to nothing. So. True believers are the only ones with whom the gospel can be considered as wisdom. If you're not a true believer, you're going to say, this doesn't make sense. The preaching of the cross is to those who perish foolishness. So what Paul goes on to say, as I looked at uh, how this could look, look to all of us, is that true wisdom is not humanly discovered. He goes in verses 6 to 9, and he discusses this a little bit more. You know, it's impossible for creatures to fully understand the Creator. It's impossible for finite people to understand an infinite God. We sang immortal, invisible, God only wise. Uh, you know, it's only the, the splendor of light hide, hides, uh, hideth thee. Um, but unless God reveals things about himself, we would not know about this because God is uh, incomprehensible in that regard. Blessedly, he's a God who speaks. He's a God who demonstrates himself. He's a God who puts his fingers all over creation so that we, as we look at the Grand Canyon, as we even have a wonderful day uh, in San Antonio where the sun is shining and everybody else is in a blizzard, uh, you know, we can say, you know, this is, this is the finger of God. This, he has shown himself uh, with regard to that. But there is a great gap between mankind and God. Uh, and... In the Garden of Eden, we saw the fellowship that God had with, that Adam and Eve had with God, and that that was broken as then sin entered. And that part of them that, that connected regularly and easily to God was disengaged. Uh, and what, what Paul is describing is how that becomes engaged again as the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, uh, having trusted in Christ, uh, and coming then into the understanding that, that there is wisdom from God that can be understood, but it, there needs to be um, a, a vehicle by which this happens. And so um, he says the rulers of this age didn't have it. Uh, 
uh, verse 7, we, no, we speak, God's, uh, we speak of God's secret wisdom. You may have the word um, mystery. You may have the word hidden in your translation. We speak of God's uh, secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory from, the, from when time began. God's wisdom, uh, he didn't reveal everything all at once. And in fact, that's the glory of the Old Testament, isn't it? The layers become uh, unwrapped and, and exposed. And we find out, uh, starting in Genesis, uh, uh, as we move into the, the rest of the Old Testament, we see how God is revealing himself. We couldn't ha handle it if, if he laid it all up on us all at once. And so this had been secret. Uh, but in Paul's thinking about, about mysteries and about secrets, there was a growing influence in that time uh, of a, a movement called Gnosticism, which said that only the really enlightened people uh, can understand because there are mysteries that are, that, uh, are very, very hard and impossible for others to understand. That's not the way Paul is using this. Paul is saying, uh, Paul, God kept this secret until the time was right, and then he revealed it, and now you and I, uh, as Paul is talking to them, and now you and I in the 21st century, have more understanding about how, what God is revealing. So he says it was, a, it was hidden uh, at, from, from man uh, in verse 7, it, but that it was designed for our glory uh, from the time the, before time began. Uh, think about, uh, in fact, why don't you do this? Turn with me just back a couple pages toward the back of the Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. Because if you're interested in thinking about God's, the revelation that God has given about his purposes and how he has worked uh, in, in choosing and bringing people to salvation, uh, Ephesians 1 is a great place to be. Ephesians 1, uh, we can't read the whole thing. Really, verses 3 through 14 uh, are, are the hugely important parts of this. But just look at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then it goes on to describe what the Father did, how the Son carried it out, and now how the Holy Spirit, in verses 13 and 14, is the one who makes that real in each one of our lives. Uh, that's, I think, a little bit of what Paul was, was alluding to in 1 Corinthians, if you go back to our text with regard to that. He had not written Ephesians yet. He would not written Philippians uh, or Colossians. The, the, this was uh, before the, those teaching epistles happened. But he has the insight from God to say, that God had hidden these wonderful truths, uh, the truth of the wisdom of the gospel and how that impacts uh, lives. He had done this um, and, and he had destined all of this for our glory. Uh, interestingly enough that we are a part of the glory that God has revealed uh, through the gospel. He says, verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, they would not have been a party to uh, what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, God ordained that it would happen, and, and Jesus cooperated with the Father's plan. That is true. But Paul is saying, if these guys who are supposedly the intelligentsia, the rulers, had understood that they wouldn't have been a party to this. They would have, they would have recognized uh, the wisdom that God was revealing in Christ. Uh, so, um, verse eight, none of the, uh, verse nine. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. You may have memorized that and thought it talks about heaven, uh, but it really doesn't. In the context, as we're looking at what this is talking about, what is what is Paul speaking about? He's speaking about the glories of the wisdom that God has revealed as the, whole, the plan of salvation, the gospel, that wisdom of God that nobody could have ever figured out on their own has now been revealed. And he says, I has not, and this is a quote uh, from, from Isaiah, yes, Isaiah 64. Uh, I has not seen nor ear have heard. Even back in Isaiah's day, there was an understanding that there was a lot more 
that God was going to be bringing to pass and revealing than even was uh, understood at that particular time. I, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, and then moving into our next section, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So uh, the first nine verses remind us that this uh, that this wisdom, this divine wisdom, it can't be accessed just through human intellect alone. But then in this next section, he's going to give some understanding of the fact that true wisdom is divinely revealed. And isn't that wonderful? Because we could be left back in verse 9, verse nine and saying, none of us will ever get it. Uh, but the, as verse 10 says, God has revealed it to us. Uh, through his spirit. Uh, in our Sunday morning Bible study, we're looking at the book of John, and, and we are looking at the upper room discourse, the last um, training and, and remarks that, the, that Jesus makes to his disciples before he goes to the cross. Uh, one of the things we're not going to study, because they've just picked out the things that work for the number of weeks, uh, is what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. If you'll turn back with me to John chapter 16. Uh, Jesus, as he is speaking to these men, has he's told them, I mean, there, our lesson last week just reminded us you know, that they were really, really, discouraged and they were astounded and they were scared and all of that and Jesus says don't let your heart be troubled believe in God believe also in me but in chapter 16 which is still a part of this conversation uh, look at verse 6 of chapter 16 of John he says because I have said these things you are filled with grief but I tell you the truth it is for your good that I am going away unless I go away the counselor will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you the counselor of course is one term uh, that tries to nail down the activity of the Holy Spirit uh, another way to look at this is what Jesus Jesus is saying uh, I'm going away but I'm sending another me another me exactly like me uh, and that's true isn't it because if we have Father Son and Holy Spirit uh, one unit and yet three in essence uh, that I'm sending you another another me he says unless I go away the counselor or the helper uh, or I think King James says the comforter will not come down to verse uh, 12 in this same chapter he says I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear but when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all the truth and then it talks about how he's going to really shine the light on Jesus. He's not going to talk about himself, but he's going to talk about, about Jesus and, and illuminate that. This then, is, as we turn back to 1 Corinthians, uh, is what, 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 what happened as the Holy Spirit then came and is now the agent of eternal life within each one of us, but he's also the one who reveals the secrets of God. That's verse 10. But God has revealed this us uh, by, his, by his spirit. The only person who can really tell us about God is God. Because God is so inaccessible to the natural human mind. That's what Paul is trying to, to tell us. Well, how does, how does he do this? How does the Spirit tell us about God? And I, this is where John MacArthur really helped me because uh, he does, he, the Spirit does it three ways. First of all, in verses 10 and 11, he does it by revelation. He does it by revelation in verse 10 and 11. Uh, let's look at that. He says, for who knows well, but God has revealed us through, to us through his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The spirit is the one who knows and can give the information about God, not to unbelievers, but to believers. Uh, you know, even in a long-term marriage, uh, 
uh, or in a long-term relationship, um, there, are, there are things you, that you don't know about the other person. Uh, there are things that I've chosen not to tell my husband, but there are also things about me that, that, that I can't even explain, even after 57 years uh, of marriage. Uh, and, and Paul is saying, you know, there is something in each person that, that is not known by any other person except that person. We may not be able to verbalize it. There are, there are things that, that, you know, really in, the, in our subconscious are, are so deeply buried. But, he says, it's, in the, it's the same way with God. The only person who can know what's, what God is about, who God is, what he does, really is the Spirit of God. Uh, we can observe the things that, uh, that have happened. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, is the one who re revealed God. And in fact, in our lesson, uh, when uh, Philip said, show us the Father and, and it's, it's enough for us, uh, he, the, Jesus did show the Father uh, in John 1. No one has seen God at any time, but, but, the, but the one and only, God the one and only, the Word, Jesus, has revealed him. Uh, yes, that's true, but now the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, the one who comes, the other me that Jesus promised, he's the one uh, who, who can reveal what's really inside of God. Not everything. There are things, I imagine even in eternity we'll probably not know everything about God because he is so immense and so infinite and so, so amazing, awesome. Uh, that is true. But the Holy Spirit then, he is the author of Scripture. Uh, he used many human agents to write it, uh, but God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, is really the one who uh, has revealed in the Scripture things about God. Uh, so Paul is saying in, in, in verses 10 and 11 that, that God has revealed it by, by the Spirit, and uh, he's the one who can unearth and reveal the things of God. Uh, but how does that get to us then? And that's verses 12 and 13. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. The process of transmitting God's truth is done by the Spirit. He says, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Uh, Paul says, we are the ones who are giving this forth. Uh, and the we does not, in this case, refer to uh, all Christians. We refers to the ones who have been given the revelation of God uh, the prophets and, uh, and the apostles, other writers of Scripture. Um, in John 14, Jesus said, the Spirit is going to remind you of the things that I have taught so that you can jot, write them down uh, truthfully. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who, do, who does this. Uh, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, we're told uh, that, that it's the Spirit who reveals the, the, the things of God, and he inspires then the words of this book that we, that we have. Uh, there is a, there is a, the New International Version has a footnote which may give us a little bit more insight into what verse 13 is saying. Uh, the insight the, in verse 13 this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but by words taught by the Spirit, and then perhaps better, re, better uh, translated, interpreting spiritual truth to spiritual men. Uh, in other words, the, the, the apparatus has been engaged by the Holy Spirit coming into your life and mine through our relationship with Jesus. Now that it's engaged, now the Spirit can talk to us, can give us information through this inspired word. Uh, the word that was given to the apostles, as Paul says, we, uh, and also I think linking himself, as Peter does, uh, with the Old Testament prophets as well. So how does the, the Holy Spirit uh, 
Uh, how is this divinely revealed? Well, first of all, he reveals what he knows in verses 10 and 11. Then he inspires those who then can pen this and put it in inspired words. Remember, all scripture is breathed out by God. Uh, that's verses 12 and 13 by inspiration. <clears throat> and then verses 14 to 16 say how it gets to us regular garden variety Christians because it says <clears throat> in verse 14, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, Paul is using a term uh, in, in the Greek that talks about the all of mankind that participates in the same kind of existence. Uh, this is the natural man, the man without the spirit. He's going to move in, in our coming weeks uh, into more terminology like this, but he's saying the, un, the unconverted man, the man who's just walking along in, in life as everybody else does. Uh, that person uh, cannot understand the things that come from God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because his spiritual antenna has not been activated. Uh, and so he says, he contrasts this natural man the unconverted man with the spiritual man. And he says, these things are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man, verse 15, makes judgment about all things, but he himself is not any, subject to any man's judgment for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. Uh, in a way, I think that's, you know, we think we understand it and then we read the rest of these words and we say, hmm, what's he saying about judgment, judgment and all of that? God has to open our eyes to under, of understanding for us to, to be able to grasp, to be engaged with spiritual truth. He does that as he has revealed himself and inspired the words of scripture. And then the process that the Holy Spirit has, we call illumination. Illumination, shining light on what is true. The Holy Spirit's function in your life and mine, among other things, is to illuminate, to make clear what it is that the truth of the word is saying. So the, the divinely uh, given wisdom uh, is by, by, um, by revelation, it's by inspiration, but then as you and I engage with it, it's by illumination. And the Holy Spirit is, is the member of the Trinity that within you and me uh, is, is responsible for that. Uh, <clears throat> the psalmist says, you know, open my eyes that I can understand wonderful things uh, from your word. And you and I uh, are able, as we ask the Holy Spirit to engage us and open our eyes that we can see wonderful things, the illumination of the scriptures. So there's the revelation, there's the inspiration, and then there is the illumination. Now this doesn't mean that we know or understand everything just because, you know, all of a sudden we turn on the Holy Spirit and he, you know, gives us f from A to Z and all, all of history and, and all of that. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that he's revealed belong to us and to our children. Uh, and so these are the things that Paul is saying that are accessible to us through the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that we don't need human teachers. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about the gifts that God has given to the church. And one of the gifts that is given are pastors and teachers in order to be able to help people understand what the Word of, of God is. And it doesn't mean that study isn't, that we don't have to work at this because uh, remember what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he says, you know, do your best, uh, really work at making yourself approved to God uh, and rightly divide the word of truth. There is, just as we're here this morning, there is work that's involved, uh, it just doesn't come to us in a vision as the Holy Spirit works in us through the word, he illuminates the truth in, in, in these ways. <clears throat> 
And it's really interesting because he says, um, the spiritual man, verse 15, makes judgment about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Uh, you know, a person who is unregenerate, who is not born again, a, a non-believer, looks at Christians and says, I don't get you. Uh, you know, and and how, how, do, how can you be so sure about this? Uh, how can this truth make a difference in your life? The unregenerate, the person who does not have a spiritual uh, life within him, uh, that person really wants to make a judgment about how kooky Christians are. And yet, what Paul says, that doesn't work. Uh, that judgment is not valid at all. Uh, we need to be discerning. Uh, we need to understand that we don't know all the answers with regard to that. And there, there's a lot more in the scripture about uh, how we, we make truth um, and the contextual uh, work of, of, the, of this word apply uh, to our understanding. But it does mean that the scripture can be understood by every Christian who is diligent and obedient. One of the principles of the Reformation back in the 16th century was that you didn't have to have a priest to tell you what the Word of God said. The, the uh, understanding that the regular believer could handle the Word of God, uh, not get all the answers, and <laughs> this is important for us this week, isn't it, because we had to rely on uh, the Holy Spirit to help us understand what Paul was saying here. Uh, but Paul says, um, the spiritual man makes discernment about all things, makes judgment about all things. Uh, there is a wisdom that comes from the spirit within the spiritual man, contrast to the natural man. Uh, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Uh, the, the outside people looking in are not able to make a valid judgment about what the believer is understanding from the scripture. Um, and then the quote, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Nobody except the Spirit, as we say. And then Paul concludes this section with, but we have the mind of Christ. That's not a statement of pride. That's a statement of humility. We have the mind of Christ. Uh, I don't know, did your, did your mind go to Philippians chapter 2? Uh, this was another church difficulty situation. Uh, this was two ladies who refused to get along, and he's appealing uh, to these two ladies to get along uh, because their disruption of the unity of the body is really having uh, bad effects on this church in Philippi. And, and he says, your attitude, your mind, in verse... Um, Five of Philippians 2, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider himself to be equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Uh, the mind, what, what does the mind of Christ produce in you and me? Uh, what does human wisdom, what does spiritual wisdom uh, produce in the believer? Confidence, yes. Understanding, yes. But humility as well. And I imagine that as Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ, he was thinking about the ones who are saying, I am a Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Peter, I am of Christ. Uh, the solution to the partisanship within the church is the mind of Christ. We have. We have the mind of Christ. Does that surprise you when, when all of the junk comes at you throughout, through the media today and, and through our, our sinful nature? We do have the mind of Christ. You and I, as we use these means that God has given to us, the revelation of himself, the wisdom that comes from that, how that has been given in the inspired word of God, 
and then how he illuminates that in your life and mine. Uh, it's, it's, you and I each are at different stages, are we not? We need a little bit of a different corner illuminated. Uh, somebody, you may, may need a little different corner illuminated than, than I do. Uh, but God is trustworthy, and the wisdom that he gives to the spiritual man slash woman uh, with regard to that is the kind of, of wisdom that accesses the wisdom of the creator of the universe, the one who put it all together, the one who knows uh, the end from the beginning, the one who has supplied everything that, that you and I need, as P Peter says, for life and for godliness. This is the wisdom that Paul says it, he was preaching. He was preaching through the gospel, the good news, uh, and that wisdom then gives forth into the, the, the mind of Christ as the Holy Spirit gives wisdom in the life of the believer. An amazing, amazing thing. Do you realize that this is a God who speaks? He's spoken in ways that we can understand. He's given people to us to access spiritual wisdom. He's given people to us who can give us, show us the way we have the mind of Christ. And so Paul is saying, I'm not going to apologize at all. I'm not going to apologize at all for the wisdom uh, that, I'm, that I've been preaching. Uh, the wisdom of this world, the natural wisdom, the wisdom of the non-spiritual person uh, is going to fade away. What did he say at the beginning of this? He said, um, there, um, the wisdom uh, that uh, is of the worldly is, is going to pass away. It's going, it's going to fizzle. But this is the wisdom that I preach. He's not doing this in a proud way, but in an importantly strong way to set the stage for what he's now going to be telling uh, the, the Corinthian Christians in their dilemma. Uh, and he tells us this today. Uh, as I say, in this section, we, we see some of the process of God's revelation that, that's not really defined in other sections of Scripture. Uh, and so God has revealed that to it. This is valuable. This is valuable for you and for me in, as we need wisdom, as we come to wisdom, whether it's from Proverbs, whether it's uh, regarding the Gospel, it's whether, whether it's uh, wanting, just desiring to know God better. How does that come? It comes through revelation, through uh, the inspiration of scripture, and also then through the way he illuminates that in your life and mine. Isn't, that, isn't he a great God? Lord, I thank you. Thank you that you have given us everything that we need. You didn't have to reveal anything about yourself. Uh, and yet, as we move into the kind of wisdom that the Holy Spirit uh, allows us to go and learn, uh, we find that we're, we're ne we never stop. Uh, there's so much about you. You are incomprehensible, and yet you make yourself known. And so I thank you for that. I thank you that no matter if we are new to this scripture, uh, there, are, there are things for us to just dig out and treasure. Uh, if we've been looking at the scripture for years and years and years, there is still value and insight and wisdom that comes as we see your word. It's, it's, the, it's the secret formula uh, of why this book is what it is to each one of us. It's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it moves into our lives uh, with, with wisdom, with conviction, uh, and yet with confidence in you. So help us, Lord. Uh, to employ these means that you've given us in a way that causes us to even further glorify you. Will you do that so that your name will be praised? In that name I pray. Amen.